welcome back to my channel my name is Olive this video is going to kind of be a beginner's guide to pranayama where I outline what pranayama is the concept the practice of it when it comes to our yoga practice and I'm also going to show you five of my favorite pranayama techniques that I do myself and that I also teach my students to start with what does pranayama mean to break it down prana means life force or breath and then ayama means expansion, control, or suspension of the breathing. So when we kind of marry the two concepts together, it's this idea of controlling the breath, suspension of the breath, expanding our life force. Because the breath is such an important component of our daily lives, we obviously do it unconsciously, but we have sort of developed poor breathing patterns that have links to other health concerns. And we need to come back to this idea of conscious breathing and doing it to benefit ourselves in our daily life, but also our yoga practice. I know it's not the most like sexy form of yoga, but without our breathing, we couldn't move. Because you think about it, the breath is the first thing that happens when we come out of the womb and breath is the last thing that happens before we die. So it is such an important component to sort of really hone in on and understand. So our pranayama techniques that we do, they usually focus on one or more of the components when it comes to our breathing. So there are four main components to our breath, or only components. <laughs> Number one, we've got the inhalation or puraka. Number two, we've got our internal retention, so the hold at the top of the inhalation, which is antara kumbhaka. Number three, we've got the exhalation, otherwise known as rishaka. And then number four is the external retention, so the hold at the end of the um, exhalation, otherwise known as baya kumbhaka. So our pranayama techniques sort of involve one or more of these components, and I'm now gonna break down five of them for you. Number one, we have got our ujjayi breath. The ujjayi breath just simply means victorious breath, and it's also known as ocean breathing, because when you do it, when you practice it, it kind of sounds like waves rolling in and out of the ocean. It is usually practiced alongside our asana practice, and you most commonly find it in styles like Ashtanga yoga. If you've ever been to an Ashtanga class, you'd hear all these practitioners breathing really, really loudly, and that is your Ujjayi breath. So why is it beneficial? It's beneficial because it's a constant reminder to breathe when we go throughout our asana practice. For me and for my students, I've noticed that when there's a pose that is difficult or when there is a pose that is new, the breath is the first thing that is sacrificed. It goes out of the window because you're focusing so intensely on doing the pose or holding the pose or whatever it is. So by having this ujjayi breath, it's a constant reminder to keep breathing, to keep your nervous system in check and to not let it elevate and get sort of stressed out. So it keeps you more level-headed, more grounded throughout your asana practice. In order to perform it, like I said, you can obviously do it as you are going throughout your asana, but I'm gonna show you how to do it and just get to grips with it while sitting down. So whenever you practice pranayama, you try to have a neutral position in the spine. So whether you sit on a chair or you're standing or you're sitting on the floor like this, just try and have a nice neutral position. To practice ujjayi breath, you just start by taking a normal inhalation, mouth is shut, we're just breathing in and out the nose. And then you're gonna hold for about a second or two. So again, this internal retention. And then when you exhale, you're almost going to make like a whisper coming out of your nostrils. The exhale is nice and slow and there's a constriction at the back of your throat. What that sounds like. And then a little bit of a hold at the bottom before you restart. So again, let me just do a full round so you get used to what the whole thing is like. So that was just two rounds. And what you've noticed is that the inhalation as well can kind of sound like the ocean. Depends on the practitioner. You can make this noise as loud or as quiet as you would like. Just be mindful as well because I kind of overdid it when I 
first started doing this, I sort of created like too much strain and I caused myself to have quite a sore throat for a number of days. So just be mindful when you do practice to not overexert yourself and not force the inhalation or the exhalation or force yourself to hold onto the breath way too much. So maybe just get used to it practicing a couple of rounds up from like five to 10 minutes a day, see what feels comfortable. Another really helpful technique as well is to sort of like map your progression. Maybe start with a breath count of inhaling for four and exhaling for four. When you get more comfortable, maybe increase that breath count to six, to eight, to 10, whatever it is, and take it from there. And obviously see what it feels like when you start to move through, say, a sun salutation or a sequence and see if you can draw in the ujjayi breath. Second one is Nadi Shodhana, also known as alternate nostril breathing. So this technique works both the left nostril as well as the right, and the aim is to almost balance the two. And because our nasal pathways work with our brain, it also helps to balance the two hemispheres. Also, like little side fact, we have something called our nasal cycle. So at any point throughout the day, it's going to be easier to either breathe through the left or breathe through the right nostril. So you can do this right now with me. Just block off your right nostril, breathe in through the left, so inhale. And then just exhale normally. And now breathe in through the right. And then exhale normally. So you'll notice that one is a little bit more congested or blocked than the other. For me right now, my right side was easier to breathe through. So our nasal cycle sort of alternates throughout the day from about 30 minutes to two hours. So maybe in two hours time, my left will be a little bit easier to breathe through. And that's just a way to sort of like regulate our breath and there's like deeper things going on as well, which is probably for another video, but it's just quite an interesting concept to understand. So what Nadi Shodhana looks like and how it is practiced and why do we practice it? So Nadi Shodhana, why we practice it is obviously, like I said, to sort of balance the two sides, left and right nostril breathing, but it's also a really lovely way to also stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system. Parasympathetic nervous system is more related to our rest and digest systems in the body. So lower heart rate, lower levels of blood pressure. People say as well, because you're more in this parasympathetic state, it's good for stress. It can be good for anxiety and just sort of understanding and managing those components. So we're less into the fight or flight response. So it's quite nice to do when things perhaps get a little bit too much. So how do we practice that? Take your most dominant hand, for me that's my right, and use the thumb to block off the right nostril. Obviously this is gonna be a little bit hard with your left hand, so you might just have to alternate, but my right thumb is gonna block off my right nostril. And then your, the rest of your hands, it depends what you like. Some people take index and middle finger and place it on their forehead. Can be a form of like concentration, or you can have it floating off to the side. What we're gonna do later on is either block off the left nostril with a pinky or the middle finger. So just bear that in mind. Some people practice like this as well. So blocking off the right nostril, take a nice inhale through the left. And then the retention phase, we block off both nostrils holding for about a second. <laughs> and then we exhale out of the right. And then again, pause in that external retention. Then again, inhale through the right. Blocking off both and then exhale through the left. So that is one cycle. It's kind of creating this little loop in between the two sides. So let me do it uninterrupted for two rounds. Just do one more round. Cool. So I just changed up my hands as well just to show you what that would look like. Obviously it can get a little bit confusing where all your fingers are going. But the idea, again, is just to have a little bit more awareness on the inhale, on the exhale, 
looking more specifically at left nostril and right nostril, giving them separate amounts of attention. So again, you can practice this anywhere between five, 10 minutes a day. And if you get more and more comfortable with it, see if you can increase that breath count from four to again, six, eight, 10, and try to keep it even for both, with the holds being about a second. Third, we have Samavriti, otherwise known as box breath or equal breath. Vritti means fluctuations of the mind in Sanskrit, so kind of like when our mind is everywhere. So this breath kind of works to like slow everything down, try to focus in on the present and what we're feeling right now, rather than letting all this like chatter happen in the mind. So again, super simple to practice. Hands are resting, you're in a neutral position in the body. And all you're going to do is breathe in and out of the nostrils, but everything is going to be equal. So we're coming back to working on the four components of the breath. We inhale, say for the count of four. We hold in that internal re retention for four. We exhale for four. And then external retention is again holding for four. The more you develop this, the more you become aware of it, you can again increase the numbers of the breath control. The breath holds from six to eight to ten. So let's just do two rounds, what that looks like. Inhaling for four. Holding for four. Exhaling for four. Holding for four. And then you continue. <laughs> so again because it doesn't really look like you're doing much you can practice this anywhere anytime say you're I don't know working or you're in a cafe or you're traveling it's quite a nice thing to just practice by yourself without involving the hands or making it super audible so it's quite an accessible form of the practice but it's really good as well just to hone in on your awareness your conscious awareness of your breathing Number four, we've got Brahmi Pranayama, otherwise known as Bumblebee Breath. This is one of my favorite ones to teach because it's, it's a little bit obscure. And when I first demonstrate it to my students, I get really weird mixed reactions, but it's actually perhaps one of the most comforting kind of breaths, I guess, that you can do. You can practice this one of two ways. You can practice it either seating or you can do it in child's pose. So I will show you both. Basically what we do Again, we inhale normally, but then when we exhale, everything is shut. We're just always breathing in and out of the nose, but we're going to hum. So you go, and just creating this like vibration from your body. But when we do this as well, you have two options with the hands. Number one, we try to place the thumbs onto our little like sides, our tragus on the side of our ears, and we kind of like block off our ears so that when we do hum, everything is a little bit more internal and we're just focusing on ourselves. We can't really hear any external noise. So you have the option of just keeping the thumbs there and blocking them off, either sitting or in child's pose. Option two is that you come into a mudra with the rest of the fingers. So it goes ears and then index fingers go to the corner of your eyes and then middle fingers go to the edge of your nose and then ring a finger above your lips, pinky fingers just below the lips. And we're just lightly holding. The idea is that we're kind of like getting in touch with the rest of our senses. Obviously this isn't accessible or like enjoyable for everyone to have like the fingers placed around your head. So if it doesn't feel comfortable, maybe take fingers to the top of the head or just like holding wherever you feel comfortable with. So let me show you what it looks like sitting down and then we will come to do it, or I'll show you what it looks like in child's pose. So blocking off the ears, I will do option one with my hands elsewhere first of all. So inhale, exhale to hum. Now with my hands in the mudra, Mm. 
so you can make it as loud or as quiet as you want to do that's why it's like a little bit less accessible than our previous technique because obviously if you're doing it you might get some looks <laughs> what it looks like down in child's pose again we can come back to doing it one of two ways with the hand placement i quite like doing it in child's pose because I feel like I'm more in my own little cocoon <laughs> hence why it feels really sort of internal and cozy for a lack of better words but again with the hands as you come down you can either block off just the temples and have the hands resting above the head or you can make the same mudra have the hands coming down your face so let me do it the same way hands on top first and then in the mudra down in child's pose so again inhale Exhaling to hum. And now with my hands in the mudra. And after about five, <laughs> ten minutes of practice, however long you want to make it, you come out kind of feeling not dazed, but very, very relaxed. Because again, you are stimulating your parasympathetic nervous system. So it's a really, really nice one to do. It's also a beautiful practice um, to show your kids. One of my friends who's a children's yoga teacher shows them how to do this quite a lot. And it's a really nice relaxing form of breath to incorporate into their practice. Sylvia just gave me a really interesting point. So when you do the humming bee breath or the bee breath, maybe see um, the difference between sort of breathing from your stomach or your diaphragm or maybe breathing more into your throat. I usually just breathe from my throat automatically. It's a little bit shallower form of breathing. But when I just tried it breathing from my belly, I could have exhaled for a lot longer. So maybe just see the difference between the two. But what this breath is also showing you, or what it's trying to teach you all in all, is that you have so much of a longer exhalation than we actually think. Basically, if you take care of the exhale by completely trying to empty the lungs, the inhalation will automatically take care of itself and you'll be able to have a fuller and deeper inhale. So there we go, humming bee breath. Number five and the last one I'm going to show you, these two breath techniques kind of go hand in hand because it depends on your ability to curl your tongue, which not everyone can do. So the first one is shitali, the second one is shikari. They are super beneficial um, breath techniques to do when you're looking to cool down the body. So like when it's really hot weather, perhaps when you're having, I don't know, say like a hot flush or you've just done a really strenuous workout and you feel really, really hot all over. It's quite a nice one to do to just cool down the internal systems of the body. So the breath technique, what you do you either curl your tongue, and if you can't, I will show you the second option. Again, sitting down, neutral spine. We're going to inhale. So you start with like normal breath, just to sort of regulate and check in. And then when you're ready to inhale and start the practice, you curl your tongue and stick it out just a little bit. So you're taking in sips of air through this tongue, kind of like sipping through a straw. So it looked like this. And if you can't do that, no worries. The other alternative to do is taking in sips of air through almost like a smile. It looks a little bit like manic, but this is the option. So you'd have your teeth together, you're smiling, and you'd go like this on the inhale. So again, you're sucking in air nice and controlled. And the idea with both of them is to feel this cool air coming down into the body. And with both of them, the exhale, you close down the mouth and you just exhale out of the nose. So, cool. What that would look like, a full round of both. I'll do um, shitali first and then shikari second. So shitali, normal breathing. And then when I'm ready to start the practice, Cool. 
second option. So again, just to reiterate, maybe somewhere again between two, three to five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever feels good, just as long as it takes to feel that sort of like cooling process happen into the body. But yeah, I used to practice it quite a lot in summer when I just needed some form of cooling down because I found that super, super beneficial. And there we go. That is my five techniques to show you guys. I hope through all of this, you've sort of understood how important it is to regulate the breathing and to have a dedicated practice towards it and how beneficial that can be towards not only our asana practice, but also our daily life and how each of these five breathing techniques work on the different components of the breath by either just one or two of them. There are obviously certain perhaps concerns when it does come to practicing pranayama. Just be mindful of if you are pregnant, if you have diabetes, high or low blood pressure, any existing heart conditions. But generally these techniques are very like beginner friendly and they should work with the majority of kind of conditions it's when you start looking at the more complex more intermediate more advanced practices of pranayama like kapalabhati skull shining breath which involves quite a lot of intense abdominal pressure where those um, health concerns are perhaps like you've got to look at why you want to practice it in the first place but for the majority of the people these should be okay to do and with everything that our yoga practice has taught us we need to be patient, we need to have practice with it. It's not something that's going to happen overnight in terms of observing the benefits. Of course, there are short-term benefits to it, but the long-term benefits of practicing pranayama regularly every day are only going to show up, like I said, in the long term. So it's good to obviously persist with this and see how your practice develops. Also, what we know from our asana practice is that we are the judge of this personal practice we know when to push when to sort of retract so don't be too judgmental and say oh i gotta like exhale for like 10 breath counts because that's not going to work straight off the bat learn to slowly come into it and adapt when you are ready to don't just force it because even though breath on the surface can seem relatively simple in comparison to some of the postures we do in asana it can be just as complicated and last little thing to leave you with try to practice breath on an empty stomach just because it's a little bit easier your body's not working so hard to digest your food so you can focus a little bit more on your breath but yeah i hope you enjoyed this video i hope it was informative let me know if you would like videos in the future a little bit like this or if you'd like ones that are dedicated to a whole pranayama practice and I will see you then. So have a good one.